Just double checking everything, making sure life is good. I think we're doing great here. Something from everyone, episode 62. I'm here with Dominic Morelli. Am I saying Morelli last name? Am I saying I'm pronouncing everything Surprise correctly? Me, that's pretty correct. Hell yes, dude. I love when I get it right. It's um, it's actually more fun when I get it wrong. It's a little more embarrassing and a nice way, nice way to welcome people in. Um, episode 62, I'm here with Dominic Morelli from Shape Thrower. You're doing vocals in Shape Thrower. Uh, I know we're working on an album, so I think that's our big plug is that, yeah, stay tuned. We got stuff out. But otherwise, I know Shape Thrower is streaming everywhere. Uh, I don't think there's any shows coming. I think we have a little pause from shows before we get back into it. Is that accurate? Yep. Taking a break for probably about a month, month and a half or so. Uh, focusing on the record, uh, probably a music video. Um, having one uh, finished up as well because we got to finish the album in order to get it oh, out. Oh, yes. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a break for the time being and just kind of, you know, put our ducks in a row and get ready to hit another show. Classic band shit, yes. <laughs> Doing all the dirty work behind the scenes before it gets fun and you can talk about it publicly. Cool. Uh, my two cents is I'm booking music videos for, I guess, the fall at this point. I think I'm just about full through July, maybe August, but probably September is a better time by the time this is out and into the universe. So yes, let me know if you want to do music videos, people listening at home. Otherwise, let's talk about Gideon, dude. Uh, Shape Thrower just played a huge show last month, opened up for Gideon. It looked like, yeah, sold out upstairs Palladium. Like, that is as good of a show as you could possibly play. Oh, dude, absolutely insane. Um, like, we've played some pretty decently big shows. We have played upstairs Palladium before. Yeah. Uh, that was with Scumfuck, Worm Shepherd, uh, Victims, and there was one more band. I can't remember who, but... Um, yeah, no, absolutely surreal. Um, we ended up selling a hundred tickets, uh, for the show and people still wanted more. That's crazy. Um, and it's a 500 capacity room. So we sold out a fifth of a national touring act upstairs at the Palladium. <laughs> That's nuts. And, uh, yeah, they were, they were quite impressed with us, which was kind of cool. Cause I mean, we do, we got a pretty decent draw out there. Yeah. And just all the love and support from friends that came out. And even when we opened, it was a, what was it? Six 30 on Thursday. Yes. Um, the room was pretty much 90% filled. So, I mean, if you think about that still upwards of, you know, 400. 25 people to 450 people so that was definitely a, a huge surreal moment for us that's incredible uh my <laughs> i realized i forgot to say thank you for coming so yeah, no worries, no worries. In, thanks for a good trip down you're down here from the boston area so yes i appreciate you making the drive down um but yeah wild to play that show and to sell it 20 percent of it is a i've never heard that metric i feel like bands are always selling yeah 20 50 tickets but yeah 100 to 500 is a pretty big chunk there to have come out just to see you guys and yeah 6 30 on a thursday is not the time that everyone wants to be at the play oh, no everyone's mad dash into the show they're like i get out at five i get out at 5 30 i'm gonna yep. be there as soon as i can and then yep. luckily everyone did make it on time and it, dude, it was just a banger it was really Hell really yeah. fun especially with getting like it's been my favorite band since high school, yeah. so um, getting to share a stage with them is really, really cool. That rules. Mm. Anything that happened on stage that I wouldn't know about from watching backstage? So, like, as a, I think one of the things I love about bands, right? So we we're just talking about how I'm not musical at all. I have no musical ability, and as I talk to bands, the more thing, the more I realize that things are always wrong on stage. There's always someone who can't hear something. There's always some click not working, some cable that didn't work before set that was a disaster. And I'm always amazed of how few of those things ever make it to me in the audience, where if I wasn't talking to you, I would never know that these little things went wrong. Is there anything in that show that stood out or anything, yeah, in the lead up to it where someone got a flat tire on the way, one of these like annoying disasters that happened on the day of or something? Um, surprisingly, no. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, for, for, we all plan pretty well for this show. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, sometimes there's those little bad, bad spells of locks that happen. Yeah. Um, but no, everything was so smooth sailing, man, and I, I couldn't have asked for a more perfect day that's great I, like we were like we were stressed and obviously you know it's one of our as biggest shows ever yeah but as soon as we were there we were on stage it was just like all melted off like butter so Hell yes. it was all good but was no that, was that your personal biggest show uh um, yes me that's this is actually my first band too so damn that's a great segue first band doesn't make any sense to me here so i'd love <laughs> to go back to square one because it seems like you have all the charisma all the presence on stage that makes this make sense and i think you're kind of a recent addition to shape Throw. i think it's maybe the last year or two is that uh, accurate uh it's been just about three years i think it was three years in march hell yeah okay that's crazy, though. It feels like in three years, you shouldn't have as much charisma and presence on stage and much energy going on there. So where does things start for you? Like, as, you, as a six-year-old, are you playing instruments? You mentioned that drums, I think, are your first? Yeah, actually, it was probably around that age, six, okay. seven years old. Uh, my pops got me a, a DW beginner kit and, you know, played for a while, probably till about, you know, 12, 13 years old. Um, like I said before, yeah, you know, lost interest as kids do stuff like that. Yep. And, uh, but you know, over the years, um, you know, I just had friends in bands. I was always going to shows. Um, I helped promote, uh, with a, a couple companies, stuff like that. I've also helped manage a band. So it just kind of, the, the scene was natural for me. I knew sure. what was going on. Um, and then 
it started more with me just doing vocals in my room. Um, then when I started driving around 16 years old in the car, <laughs> screaming my head off down the road. As you should, yeah. And, um, and then it was, it was basically just me recording 30-second Snapchat clips of just covers in my car okay. and um, just funny little bits that I did online involving, like, metal vocals. Mm -hmm. And um, and for years, so I, I was about three years ago, but Maddie, for, like, a year and a half, messaging me, sending me video messages, hey, join the band. <laughs> join the band and I'm just like, ah, you know, cause at the time I started as a deathcore vocalist. So okay. I was doing a lot more lows, snarls, growls, stuff like that. And he goes, I promise we can go heavier. We can go heavier. Just join the band. So after about a year and a half of him prying, I, you know, I and said, yes. Do you have Maddie have a friendship at this point or is he just like, you're good enough? Like, yeah. Is there a mutual friendship that makes this make sense? Or is he just going to you out of nowhere? Like, Hey, you're the guy. Yeah, no, actually I've known him for a very long time, like okay. back in his in depths and tides days. So, okay. um, our mutual friend is a producer who recorded in depths and tides a long time ago. Gotcha. Um, so I knew him for years, went to a bunch of his in depths and tides shows Hell and yeah. then just, you know, over time he was seeing me post these videos and other people were too. Everyone's like, why aren't you in a band? Join a band. Just like, get it done, dude. You're good. So, but he, uh, he kind of broke me out of my shell because okay. I'm a very extroverted person, but you know, it's just like that in the moment when you're on stage and you got every, all eyes on you kind of thing, it's a whole other ball game. So it's one of those sports you have to be brought into young, whereas you're saying that it's a, there's an interesting parallel to me to like hockey or something where it's like, you have to start playing hockey at three years old or else you never really have a chance to do it. And as you're describing being on stage, it's like, yeah, you kind of have to, it seems, it would make sense to me that as a 16 year old, you kind of have to be a vocalist on stage because by the time you're 25, it's almost too late to be that vulnerable and yeah, to take that much of a risk is so much more of a young man's game. So it's interesting to hear you express that. Uh, that yeah, it sounds like there was a, a real learning curve that had to happen to get you from being out, being able to do vocals to being in a band and doing it on stage and doing the whole performance that comes with it. Yeah, which is kind of weird to me too because when I was a kid, I did martial arts for about 10, 11 years, which also okay. kind of helps the screaming aspect of things. Learned I'm how to sure. use the diaphragm at a young age. Yeah. Also being Italian and loud. <laughs> Everything just... All worked out. <laughs> what martial art were you doing? Uh, it's called Tang Sudo. It's like a Southern Korean, like defensive style martial arts. Cool. Okay. Um, but I had two, uh, my godparents owned a karate school in Auburn, Mass. So um, Tang Sudo was my main uh, style. And then, you know, learned a little bit of like Kempo, a little bit of types of Kung Fu. Um, did a little bit here and there because we'd have seminars. But that led up to like me, we would perform on stages. We'd do demos in malls. We'd, we'd perform uh, in front of people. So, okay. I mean, I had the I had the courage to get up on stage, but that was a, a different kind of story uh, versus, you know, yelling into a microphone for the mm -hmm. first time. So, but uh, yeah, definitely got over those nerves. And I mean, it didn't happen right away. I mean, it was sure. probably like six to eight shows of me actually yeah. finding my niche and just getting comfortable with being on stage and yelling. So <laughs> what's show one then? So Maddie is in your ear and he says, yo, join shape throw or else. And yeah. A year and a half goes by of this or else. And finally you get, get in there. What is the first show like as, yeah, as you are now an adult going into your first show. So I guess how old are you is one part of that. And then, yeah. What is that first show experience like as you're, yeah, this all gets very real very quickly, I would assume. Oh, definitely. <laughs> um, so like you're talking about my first show. Yeah. 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 yeah so um, our first show was I think April of three years ago. That was edict. Loud Sounds, Sexless Marriage, and Ritual Blade. And that was at Dusk in Providence. Um, so RIP, I think. Huh? RIP, I think. Oh, Dusk. yeah, unfortunately. Uh, great venue. <laughs> yeah. Rest in peace. Um, but, yeah, no, it's just, you know, I've got little pointers from people. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, you know, focus more on breathing versus moving kind of thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Get, like start fine-tuning before you really start getting buck wild on stage and headbanging mm -hmm. and jumping around and kicking and stuff like that. <laughs> so um, I, it was very nerve-wracking, but it was about, it was all my friends there. So, I mean, I had a lot of support, um, and it just basically – I don't know, I kind of just tuned out and just went for it and it seemed to work out. So other than the lots of nerves that fell all over <laughs> me, um, that got, I got over that pretty quick. As soon as I started performing, like after yeah. the first song, I'm like, all right, I'm in the groove. Let's okay. get this going. And then, uh, yeah, it was kind of, kind of smooth sailing from there. Um, so yeah, I mean, nothing too, too major, a little bit of nerves, but mm -hmm. overall it was a great show. We had a good turnout. We packed out the place and, um, they continued asking us back cause we had a great show and, we, we love, loved that venue. So, Is it easier to perform in front of friends or like strangers? Where you're talking to your first show that you mentioned there was comfort in having friends there. And <coughs> I would almost feel like that would be more troubling. I think I would rather have my first show be like in West Virginia in front of people I've never met before and have that be my getaway. But you're describing it sounds like, yeah, having friends there is almost the positive, which to me, it seems like it would make it more nerve wracking. I agree. Yeah. If, if it's all friends in the room, yeah. I know that they're nitpicking. They're, they're, <laughs> they're criticizing. And that's fine. Any, any criticism is great criticism. And I sure. would prefer somebody coming up to me and just 
just being like, hey, you know, this part of the song kind of sucks. Like, <laughs> yeah. I heard you, you were losing breath, stuff like that. I would rather that, but yeah, yeah in front of a whole bunch of people who like probably don't know the music, if I like hiccuped and did something wrong, then you know, you can kind of just mask it and just play mm -hmm. on about it and no one will really notice it. But your friends know the music. They're yeah. They're dialing in. They're watching you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with that. Definitely would rather play in front of a whole room full of strangers than a whole room full of my friends. Yeah. Any surprises being on stage then? Like you mentioned that you had been screaming in your room for a while. So you had like, I assume your vocal cords were kind of ready for it. But that's a very different thing than doing it Yeah, in front of people and doing it kind of on the spot, on command. Were there any like growing pains there of yeah learning how to use your voice? I know people have issues with their voice going out or other yeah dumb stuff that can happen with their vocal cords. Oh, I'd say for probably first like two or three shows mm -hmm. had to learn how to regulate my airflow, yeah. how hard to push, where to put the microphone, how close to my face kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean the, I think maybe. I think it was actually after the second show, that Hey Five Six show. Um, I did end up straining my voice a little bit, um, just because I'm like, oh god, I got this guy with a camera right in my face <laughs> on my second show ever. So um, yeah, let's just go. That balls was your to the wall. second show. That was my second show. So Damn. yeah, first show nerve wracking. Second show even more nerve wracking. Second show, so. yeah, the biggest. Did you know he was going to be there ahead of time? No, no. So we we show up to the show, and then we heard from one of our friends, AJ. He's just like. Uh, there's going to be a surprise. And I'm like, what's the surprise? And then we walk through the door and lo and behold, Sonny's just sitting at a table playing with some camera gear. And I'm like, <laughs> no fucking way, dude. <laughs> this is insane. So, um, but it, it was wick, wicked cool guy. He actually, he was coming up from a show. I think it was Philly. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have his full camera gear. I think he had just had like a single setup kind of thing. And um, so he just kind of stood off to uh, the side and was just, filming kind of basic stuff but mm -hmm. yeah he was like right there in my guitar's face and like the whole time you're watching the video he's just like kind of side-eyeing over while he's playing he's just like oh my god this is really I, happening i loved watching that yeah it was so sick seeing you guys yeah take that in and have that moment i mean did the did the video do much for you guys like i think the the platform's great and it's great that he has a platform that he is sharing other people or bringing other people on with did you feel like there was a a return from being on that platform did you feel like there were people that came to shape thrower from that video or was it more of a trophy for you guys um I think it was, I mean, we got a little bit of um, fandom from it. I mean, we had, like, you know, probably 10 to 15 extra followers and stuff like that. I think the video really only has, like, 3,000 views on yeah. YouTube, which is perfectly fine. I mean, any any exposure is good exposure. It's more than the people who are in the room. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, it's the fact that, like, it's the voting system that he has on there. So there was enough people. Obviously, we have our auto votes going every day from our friends. But, obviously, mm -hmm. that trumped other local hardcore bands and other bands that he has performed that are, uh, probably have more reputation than we do. That's cool, yeah. So that just shows us that there was enough people to either like every day or put it on auto vote. And, mm -hmm. like, that just got us to the point where I think we got the message one day. He's like, hey, you're going up on YouTube. And we're like... Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Thank you, man. We appreciate that. And uh, after the show, too, I did walk up to him because, I mean, how am I not going to walk up to him and shake his hand? Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, like, this is our second show with me in it and stuff like that. Obviously, we got some kinks to work out. He goes, I could tell you guys are kind of fresh. Um, but the second to last song you guys played, I loved. And I'm like, you loved one of our songs? I'm like, that's pretty cool. So um, That's an interesting, like, uh, it's a really honest feedback, right? Because he's not saying... I think if I'm signing that scenario, I say, yeah, you guys were great. I loved every second of it. And I think for him, it almost makes the compliment much more valid when he starts with, there's some kinks to work out, like acknowledging the the elephant in the room, I guess, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, and it's a really interesting, I guess, way to give a compliment where it's much more genuine than a, a platitude that seems like it would go over better. But I think if he says, oh, great set, like that doesn't stick in your brain. And by being honest and genuine in that moment, it does stick, but it's a much more like hard feedback to give like it's uh i would much rather look at you after i look at everyone after their set and say great job like it's very rare that i look at anyone after their set and say anything other than great job because it's like i don't want to be the arbiter of that like it's not my place to tell you how your night went i guess is my my two cents but of course every time i say great set i know that no one doesn't register with anyone like it's a platitude right no one hears that and goes oh i did do great like it's it's what sonny said that registers and is much more of the the feeling of greatness than being told you did great. Agreed. That's yeah. an interesting, like, yeah, a little caveat there. And I guess like, a tribute to how smart he is and how, uh, I don't know. Yeah. You don't, um, you don't ever want to be that guy that brings, I mean, yeah, you could, that, I mean, it's a tough cookie to crack, but yeah, yeah, someone might be riding that high. Like, Hey, I just played a dope show. And in the back of your head, you're like, well, I got some footnotes for you. <laughs> uh, but you know, obviously if yeah. you see him in the moment, stuff like that, you know, just great set, yeah. you know, enjoy yourself kind of thing. So, but I get where you're coming from on that. That's a really interesting, yeah. And the second show there is like a, a terrifying place to be as your most, yeah, distributed thing is your second time ever doing this thing. I mean, that's a, yeah, it must, be, must have been extra nerve wracking. Oh, definitely. And I mean, we, the room was decently filled too. I think there was probably yeah. like about 100 people there. I mean, mm -hmm. the room could fit like 300 people and something like that. But yeah. I mean, for second show, a not known band, you know, we had a good crowd out there to actually support us too. So, and they could 
the, everyone that moved to help us make us look a little bit better than we were that day too. So, um, yeah, and overall that was a, that was a great experience and as, that kind of opened us up a little bit more in the hardcore community too. People started recognizing our name a little bit more. So as you look back at that, are you still proud of that? So obviously you're proud of the achievement, you're proud of the moment, but as you look back, is it a second show? Uh, where I think I look back at the second music video I ever did and I go, holy hell, I wish no one ever saw that. And I'm glad that no one is seeing that right now. Whereas you're looking back at your second show going, fuck, I wish, or I think if I were you, I'd be looking back saying, I wish no one saw that, but it's on the biggest platform of any of our sets. Like there's a, a weird uh, dichotomy there. I'm pulled in every direction in that kind of way. Cause you know what? Yeah. I kind of wish, yeah, I, I don't want people to see the flaws in the video and uh, what we fucked up and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. also too, it's a good, it's, constructive you know yeah. you go back and you look on things where it's for people to see how much we've grown as a band since that date so mm -hmm. hey guess what yeah we came and we, we brought the party that day but hey come to a show now we're, we're project x pretty much <laughs> at that point so um yeah and it's it's, it's a weird thing to think about <laughs> project x at that point <laughs> that's fair enough i guess yeah it's just hard to bring people to the palladium and yeah outsell some of the other things on that package then <laughs> i guess you're not wrong on that although yeah i guess Maybe a little short of Project X, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. something to grow into, something to look forward to. Hell yes, dude. Uh, where does the energy on stage come from? So I feel like you're, yeah, a monster on stage. I guess as you're saying, maybe this get, takes us back to the martial arts things where, it, yeah, it feels like there's a freedom on stage and a freedom of movement on stage. And I'm wondering if that is, yeah, something you would attribute to the martial arts. Where does that come from? Is there someone you're emulating? Like, yeah, what is, where would you attribute that to? Um, so... Me personally, I'm just a very eccentric type of person. I'm a very extroverted person. Um, so I don't have any issues just going buck wild and just <laughs> okay. going, going loose and stuff like that. So, um, But we played a show, it was last year in March? Yeah, last year in March with uh, Barrier Dead, uh, Edict, and Great American Ghost. Mm -hmm. And um, Maddie, my drummer, was saying, hey, I want you to watch Ethan from Great American Ghost. Yeah. So he goes... He's one of the, like the best frontmen I've seen in a long time, especially Nick nowadays around this area. The dude is just on point with his presence, yeah. um, his energy that he brings. So I get a lot of inspiration from him. And from on that day, like I've seen him perform online, stuff like that. It's just the way he brings it to the stage is just it tickles my fancy and ruffles my Jimmy's real good <laughs> kind of thing. So um, yeah, so he's he's the inspiration. Uh, also too, I just like I just love the music. So yeah. I just unload and just allow myself to have fun and show other people that, Hey, we're not just some sticklers. I'm, I'm some stiff guy up on stage, like, uh, or something like that. Yeah. You're going to see me bouncing around. You're going to see me kicking, spin kicking, whatever. Hey, I'm hopping off the stage. I'm coming in the pit with you guys. And I'm going to be screaming. If you hit me in the head, guess what? Fuck <laughs> it. We're going to keep going. So, um, yeah, I mean, this, I guess, you know, that's my inspiration a little bit and just, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, there's you know. like a lead by example energy there also, where it's like, if you're having that much fun on stage, like it makes it easier for everyone else in the room to have that much fun where you're right that when there's the band on stage that is yeah stiff and scared of their instruments, it's like, Oh, we're all scared to support yeah. you too. It's like, let's match energy. It's like, yeah. let's have a good time. Like we don't, we don't have to sit there like twiddling our thumbs <laughs> or something like that. Like let's have some fun with this. So is that easier than it? It sounds like that'd be a much easier thing to do in the Gideon room where I think as I, as I imagine being in a band that I guess I'm speaking for experience here, I've done some shows where I show up and it's like, my job is to make this show, this video of the show look as great as possible. And that's very easy when you're at the Gideon show and it's sold out and the room is full and everyone's electric. Sometimes you show up and the show's not quite like that Gideon show. Sometimes you show up and the room's a little bit more empty than that to be to be polite about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it's always a really challenging moment in that th or really th challenging thing in that moment of like, how do I, how do I do this? And how do I become the same person that I would be if the room was full when this room is empty? And I assume on stage is the same thing where like when you're on stage looking out the empty room, it can't feel as good as looking out as the sold out Palladium. And I understand that the mantra is like, oh, we're going to put the same show on for both crowds. But it's like, Ah, it's a lot easier to put on paper and to believe in than to actually actualize and yeah, make happen in reality. Yeah. Um, definitely feel that. So there's been a couple shows where it was just basically bands there and you know, yeah. like three or four people that show up. Yeah. And here's how I could see it. Yep. It's just it's band rehearsal, except you're playing with more bands. So if there's no one out there supporting the band, guess what? All the bands are out there. Just go fucking crazy for these guys, you know? Yeah. Go go throw some hands around, do some spin kicks. If there's no one in the room, you're not going to hurt anyone. So just, just bring some energy Fair. to these guys because guess what? We all have to eat that shit on the same stage, you know? Yep. Um, you're going to be playing to just us. We're just going to be playing to you guys. So why not just, you know, encourage each other and just have fun with this? Like make this a little step up than just band practices. Like this is an actual rehearsal now. So I like that. I like the idea of a dress rehearsal there. I guess maybe it's the other analogy there. Yeah, like yeah. A way to get value out of the stage time, even though there's not a, not a crowd there to generate the value along with you. Yeah, we already made the 45 minute to an hour drive. Why not? <laughs> Let's just still have some fun. Yeah. So we can 
any shows that you played that stand out as particularly uh, on the low end? So I'm always curious about like venues here. So I'm not really curious about turnout, but it's like I've heard people play carpet stores. I've heard people play all kinds of candy stores, food stores, all kinds of bizarre venues, skate parks. Where's like the craziest place you've played? Where's somewhere that stands out in your memory as a, as a shape trailer venue? Um, I think... So there's a couple places. Uh, there's uh, the place in New Bedford, the vault. Um, so they have a stage side, which I think is maybe like a 300 cap room or something like that. Okay. But usually when it's smaller shows, you play in a restaurant. So okay. it's basically like a bunch of windows with a bay door that you put your back to. And then you're facing the restaurant. There's a bar on this side. There's uh, high tops here. And there's an alleyway that goes down. And then it goes to like the back of the kitchen. And then there's a little area where you set up merch. But it's just a restaurant. So that was probably a weirder one, but one of the coolest places that kind of sticks out is uh, Top Shelf Tattoo, another, you know, rest in pa- uh, peace kind of thing. Damn. Um, so it's a tattoo shop on Elm Street in Manchester, New Hampshire. And the, uh, the owner of the place, he owns a tattoo shop, he lives above it, and then he decked out the whole uh, basement That's to so have a little venue. It's probably shoved like 75 people in this basement. It's, it's tight, tight, but it's very intimate, and the shows are always bangers. Everyone's having a blast. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's cool because he has his own little bar set up in there too, so him and his wife and like some of the tattooers will come down and watch the show. Oh, that's the dream. And you just play in this little pocket downstairs. <laughs> there's no stage, there's no nothing. They've took them like months to get an actual sound system in there. Um, but it was really freaking cool. Uh, but unfortunately, it did get shut down by the city. I was about to say, there's no way that's legal. Yeah. It sounds so sick. I mean, it was, it was a BYOB place too. So, <laughs> but a I mean, tattoo shop also is like, that can't yeah, be safe. They, to code. They, they definitely were like carting people and stuff like that, sure. making sure, you know, people were, you know, responsibly drinking and stuff sure. like that. Nobody was leaving there absolutely plastered. Um, sure. But I, I just don't think the city liked the fact that, because every show had to be done by 11. Noise ordinance Noise. is what yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. Understandable. So, yeah. I think maybe one or two shows might have played a little bit later. Might have gotten some complaints from people, and then uh, I was think it in like a residential area. No, it was like it's like right in like downtown. I think Manchester. <laughs> okay. So you're in the city, and then like you just find this tattoo shop, and then the doors here for the tattoo shop, and then you walk downstairs, and then that's just the venue. Damn. That's it. I mean, I'd say it's probably <laughs> thirty feet by like fifteen feet. And that's the whole freaking run. There's two Jesus. entrances in. There's one to the back stairwell, and there's one in the front stairwell, and then people just pile in like that this. It sounds like mayhem. It, it sounds like the best, yeah, the best place to ever have a show. It's dope, um, but it took a little while to kind of, like I said, fine tune it. So uh, one of our buddies, Joe from Rap Blood, I think he was the one that brought the rug down there. So when people are moshing, they're not sliding all over the concrete <laughs> floor. Um, all over the frat juice. Oh my god, it was crazy. <laughs> um, and then, like I said, they got a sound system. Like he was going to start decking it out with fans and like you know. Get the place like with some air flowing, mm-hmm. um, but unfortunately, it was cut short due to city reasons. And uh, sure. but uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was a cool place, and uh, wish I could play more shows there. Shout out to, to Andy Raggedy Andy. He's a really yeah. really rad guy and puts on some cool shows. But um, yeah, I'd say that's probably the two venues that are stuck out the most to me. That's wild. Yeah, that is so sick. I I love the. I don't know. I think part of the fun of being a niche community is that we can get away with these things. Or if, if we were a rapper, I guess rapper maybe still could, but like a country artist is like, yeah, to kind of be in a backyard. You kind of can't be in the basement of a tattoo shop anymore at a certain, at a certain point. I think we're spoiled to get some of these adventures where for us, it was a, a point beach clubhouse. Point beach clubhouse was a venue near here. And it's literally like the storage unit for a public beach. So like in the off season, it's just like where all like the the seats, I don't even know what the hell goes in there, but it's just like, it's literally a shed. It's like uh, probably the size of this basement. Actually, it's probably about perfect. Maybe 10 feet wide, 20, 30 feet long. <laughs> and it's, we would pack it out and it was uh, not, uh, very, it was very dissimilar to the tattoo place because this place was not being carted. It was not being <laughs> maintained very well. And it was like like the only like indoor cigarette smoking venue in Connecticut ever. Like it was <laughs> just the craziest place. And we'd have all the local shows there. Like it was the spot for a while. And I assume the city ended. I don't know exactly how it ended, but I'm sure it wasn't on good terms. Pure like chaos. Somewhere. People just beating <laughs> the shit out of each other with pool noodles. <laughs> exactly. Love it. Literally pool noodles. <laughs> that is an incredible. Uh, there's a band called Shots Fired from Connecticut that uh, was filming, I think was filming. And so they went to like lots and more or whatever and spent 30 bucks on a fuckload of pool noodles. So actually, literally, yes, pool noodles were in there. And it was a big war of, of people killing each other with pool toys. That's which incredible. Which is <laughs> the best thing ever. But yeah, there's always rumors that it's going to come back. And I'm always hopeful that it will because it holds a very special, like, nostalgic place in my heart of, like, that was the spot. That was where it started. It mixes things up. It, it makes things it more does. interesting. It does. Yeah, it's not quite Gideon. It's not quite sold out. But there's some character there. It's some character building, some hair that goes on our chest, I guess, as a result of it. Heard that. Uh, any, like, dream venue that you look ahead to? For me, as I, 
as I like to look ahead, it's like, I think some of like the German, like the big like UK festivals seem so sick of these like larger in life things. Like, is there a, a dream show? Is there a dream band to open for a dream venue? Something that stands out to you as like a, a, a goal in the future? Um, venue wise, I mean, like to see us on obviously bigger stages, you know, sure. up in the four digit kind of cap rooms and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, obviously Gideon was a staple for us, uh, for the whole band. We all love Gideon. Um, but sick. one of my favorite bands actually, like, you know, like when someone asks you what your favorite band is and you just can't, there it is. Uh, yep. It took me like seven years to finally say this, but it's counterparts counterparts. I can okay. say over all genres, like dates, music have come out just as over everything. Mm -hmm. Counterparts is my favorite. So for me personally, opening up for counterparts or even like, you know, going on a small tour with them would be mind blowing for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they've gotten me through a lot in life and it's just. It's one of the most stellar bands, in my opinion. So sure. every album they make just progressively gets better and better and better. Um, so <clears throat> never never disappointed with them. Um, I don't know. Oh, I mean, well. I'd love to play with a lot of bands, man. Extortionist is dope. I'd like to play with Decayer. Decayer is from Arizona. They're wicked dope. Um, there's too many to list, realistically. So hopefully with our future endeavors, we could just start stop Same. hopping on stuff and, and, and building that resume a little I feel bit like more. there's been a lot of local headliners. So then, yeah, the next step is then, yeah, opening for the, the national headliners that come through and getting, getting your foot in that door, that next step door. Doing a little bit more than just a weekend tour kind of thing. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> I forgot you guys on the weekenders. What stands out as some of the, the weekenders there? What's the longest run you've been on, I guess? Maybe it's a good place to start there. Three days. Okay. Yeah, we did that twice. So our first one was with Rat Blood. Uh, we did Bangor, Maine, uh, Queen Cinema Music. Queen Cinema Hall or something like that. Queen City Cinema Hall or something like mm -hmm. that. And then we did Top Shelf Tattoo and then went down to Ralph's and Worcester. Um, and then we did one with The Graying and Last Sight. And that was, oh, geez, where did we go for those? Um, oh, God, I forgot. <laughs> but it was, it was relatively local. <laughs> <Went somewhere. laughs> Brain fired on that one. But It's uh, crazy. I have so much empathy for the people on tour. Uh, I feel like as a kid, there's always the meme of like some celebrity shows up in your city and says the wrong name of the city. And now it's like, we yeah, we just had this over a weekender. And for me, it's like last night I was in Boston. And there's a moment of like, wait, where the fuck am I? Like, what place am I in? And <laughs> these are, yeah, three cities for me. It was one city that I'm in. Like, it's not that hard to keep track of it. It's shocking how, how much that adds up and creeps up on you the simplest, The simplest thing is just go away as soon as you want to <laughs> try is. to think of them. So, but um, yeah, no, that, we stay pretty local, pretty much New England. Yeah. Um, but we're looking to branch out a lot more. Um, I think we're looking more towards New York, maybe New Jersey, Pennsylvania, start working down the East Coast, which would be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have friends and bands all down the East Coast. So That's the, way to do it. Um, the support that we would have with friends would be really dope. I'm sure we could set plenty up. It's just obviously being an adult, time, money, got to start organizing. All it, the so. stuff, yeah. Um, but How yeah. was van life? What was it? Sleeping in the van, was it a, Was it enriching? Was it inspiring or was it draining? Yeah, what was your two cents on living in a van? So we actually don't have a van. <laughs> so we, it easy. we all just drove. Um, so with the Bangor, Maine, uh, I live in Lemonster, Mass. So basically I'm like a half an hour from New Hampshire. And uh, so Bangor, Maine, that was probably like a, what, five, six hour drive. And then coming down Manchester, we stayed overnight in Bangor at, an, uh, at a hotel. Actually, funny story about that. Our guitarist ended up booking the hotel, but booked it for the day before the show. <laughs> so we got all the way up to Bangor, Maine. Thanks, James. And, uh, <laughs> and then so we get there and then he comes out and he's like, well, I got some bad news. Uh, I booked the hotel for last night. So here we are. Like we got the show going on in probably like an hour, hour and a half. We're like, we're supposed to be there for loading in like 20 minutes. And the next thing you're like, all right, we got nowhere to stay now. So we're looking around, blah, blah, blah. And then we uh, found a hotel that was like probably a block down. And we're like, do you guys have a room available? Like, well, we have the family suite. We're like, screw it. We'll take it. We need a place to stay tonight. So um, we just ended up doing that. And it wasn't too bad. I think it was like 300 bucks for everybody to stay in like this house style thing in a firewood inn. Um, That's so, and then, uh, same thing with the other weekend or two, it was all relatively close for us all within like an hour to an hour and a half drive. So oh, yeah. our beds were a little bit more, uh, what's the word intriguing than, sure. than a, you know, a van bench or something like that. So <laughs> is the, the road life, uh, intriguing to you? Like, I think for me, I've found that as I, as I've toured, it doesn't feel like the, the right lifestyle for me. And I think it's a lifestyle for certain people. And for me, I think I just really enjoy having a base that I'm building out of. And there's something about tour that feels very like short term where you have this really intimate six week experience with this group of people. And then you all kind of go in your separate ways. And there's these really intimate pockets and chapters that kind of then get sealed into time. It's like you come back home and it's like, home has no idea what the hell you just did for those six weeks. And it's impossible for you to then convey to home what those six weeks were. And I think that has made touring seem less appealing to me where I'm interested in doing a week or two or yeah, weekend sounds fun. But like this idea of being on the road for six weeks sounds just like not for me. Mm. <laughs> where are you kind of in that? It's like touring for six weeks sound like the goal or does it seem like, yeah, you're happy with the weekend or kind of smaller scale stuff. 
Um, honestly, both. I mean, yeah. I like the weekend stuff. It's quick, dirty. You just went and played three shows, and then you take a break for like a week or two yeah, yeah, yeah. and go back to your regularly scheduled programming kind of thing. Um, but, I mean, I, I like the concept of, you know, being gone for, you know, six weeks, you know, a couple months or something like that. Um, it, it would definitely be daunting, obviously, you know. Yeah. You got you to gotta deal with it and acclimate to it on, like, the first week or something. Um, but I like being on the road. I like seeing new places. Um, obviously, if you're doing it with a group, it's a little bit different because, you know, if me and my girlfriend are just in the car, you know, after six or seven hours, we want to know each other a little bit, but you get a little stir-crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but, you know, like especially if, like, uh, taking turns driving, stuff like that. Yeah. It, the little things make the trip a little bit more bearable, yeah. um, in my opinion, or, or I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, but I guess it also depends, too, if you've got kids, if you've got more of a family at home, yeah. are you missing them, you get homesick. Um, but, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm a pretty minimal guy. So, I mean, I got my family, love my family, but they would love to see me go out for six <laughs> weeks and enjoy myself, too. So <laughs> They want um, to rub their, wash their hands. Yeah, they're like, they're like well. we're dom-free for six weeks. Sounds good. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I mean, I, obviously, there would probably be times, too, where I'm just like, oh, man, like, I can't yeah. wait for the tour to be over yeah. or something. But I guess it all depends on where you're going, uh, like, you know, the elements of, of your environment and stuff like that. So um, I guess I'll just have to wait and see on my, well, hopefully, you know, one of those <laughs> six-week runs or something like yeah. that. So, um, but I think I think I could tolerate it pretty well. Was music, like, in the family? Like, would they <coughs> understand it all? Like, does this, does this lifestyle make sense to them? Or are you very much a black sheep pursuing someone? Oh, else? no, no, definitely they'd understand. My father, he's a bitchin' bassist. He's more of a rock and blues kind of guy, but okay. the, the dude slaps. He's fucking <laughs> sick. Um, my mom was, like, an old metalhead, um, so, like, 80s, okay, 70s kind of stuff. Okay, so this is why stuff. you got a drum set yeah. as a kid. And then, um, then my, my oldest sister's the one that really kind of kicked me into gear with the music I listen to now. I mean, I was listening to like really random stuff. Like first, first physical thing that my father handed me uh, was uh, the Pot USA CD, Presidents of the United States, self-titled. Okay. And ever since that day, I'm like sick. Love music. Um, obviously, heard stuff on the radio before. I think yeah. I was like Wicked Young. Always loved Lincoln Park. Um, but then, you know, my area where I lived, there was, you know, there was people who liked metal and hardcore, but there wasn't a lot. It was more country, yeah, yeah, yeah. rap, stuff like that. Um, but, and then here comes my sister showing me The Faceless, August Burns Red, uh, Life Ruiner, something, something, all these crazy like bands I'd never heard of before. I'm praying she's your younger sister because it'd be so much funnier. Older sister. <laughs> I'm a middle child between two sisters. <laughs> okay. And, and here's the fun part about it. We're all black belts. I got my ass beat. <laughs> it was all out of love, but. Of course. Um, yeah, no, my little sister, she was more on the side of like mainstream music. Um, she likes her like country music. I mean, stuff that would be relatable. She's like I, Mayday Parade and something like that. I'll I turn to praying you were 12 and a seven-year-old came to me and was like, yo, have you heard of the face <laughs> My little sister starts, starts moshing, kicking down my door. So sick. Um, That'd be a badass little sister. But uh, yeah, so my older sister kind of steered me in the direction of the music I listen to now. Yeah. And then uh, just through friends, middle school, high school, okay. fine-tuned it a lot more, started hanging out with bands, friends who were musicians. And then uh, that's that's pretty much the story that it so wrote. That makes a lot more sense that of why, to me, getting a drum set for your kid sounds like the worst, like, it sounds like a self-inflicted punishment. It's like, why would you get your kid this thing that's only going to ruin the quality of your life? Like, get them, get them a guitar and, like, get them headphones. It's like there's yeah. no need for them to have a drum set, but it makes sense that if yeah, music was so in the household that everyone's playing bass and yeah, mom was into metal, was all, then yeah, drums make a lot more sense there. I was also a rowdy little tyrannical asshole as a kid, <laughs> so like they needed to like I needed an output for something. So karate was one of them, drums yeah. was another, just hit stuff. <laughs> so everything just kind of worked. Any other outlets there that you were really into, or those, those are the two big like building blocks? Oh, uh, those are pretty much the two. I uh, played soccer a bunch when I was Hell a yeah. kid. Um, I wanted to play football. Parents would never let me play football though. My pops <laughs> played for Canaan High School. Or in Connecticut or something like that. So, um, but I guess you know, getting smacked around in karate, mm -hmm. I don't see much difference. But yeah, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no. Just besides that, there really wasn't much more. I mean, you know, pops and I like to do some stuff. You know, just outdoorsy stuff. I think we took up archery for a little while. That's right. Um, just small things here and there. Like I said, I was very ADHD kid, so it was like, hey, like this for three or four months. Uh oh, I like <laughs> this for three or four months now. Hyper fixate on this, so on and so forth. So. Um, but mainly it was drumming and martial arts. Hell so yeah. you also mentioned you did some like managing of bands somewhere in this process. So somewhere before joining shape thrower and after, yeah, being a six year old playing drum somewhere in the middle there, there's some managing happening. What was that about? Um, it was pretty much just one band. I mean, I helped other people out with like, you know, getting stuff going, but, uh, there was a band called Kerrigan from Worcester. Um, so for a while I was helping them book shows. I was like helping their social media, stuff like that. It was probably, it wasn't too, too long, probably about eight months to a year. What like inspired that like it seems like a 
it seems like people who get into booking shows normally are in a band and they go, oh, I already have all the connections here. And you kind of seem like you came at it from the opposite direction. Of like you didn't have the connections to be in the band. So you did all the other work then to make the band possible. Like how does, yeah, the manager thing, how does it get going for you? Uh, yeah, I was definitely green uh, when I started doing that stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, it was more of just me wanting to know the experience of it, wanting to join the band life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after years of watching local bands play in Charlton, the same venues, you know, two times a week or something like that. Um, I just started seeing the process and how things work. So I picked up on things and I would also ask the right questions with people. That's why I liked, you know, I got along with Maddie so well because Maddie's a, a very smart person and this, yeah. he's the most professional local guy that I can think of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So learning from him, learning from my producer friend, and then just taking all this information and uh, incorporating it into how I wanted to be part of this scene. And um, it, it worked out for a while, um, but, you know, it's just... There's stuff to fine tune. I really like that. The, for me, my story is similar to getting the camera stuff of like, I liked music and I thought I wanted to play guitar. And so I learned guitar, uh, teach myself, yeah, the very, very basics of it. And then I start filming like covers of myself of like, well, I got to tell people I can play guitar. And very quickly, it's like, oh, I like filming the covers a lot more than I like learning the instrument and like playing and performing and doing all that shit. Why don't I just like, yeah, do the camera side of stuff and let someone yeah. else figure out the instrument side. Uh, and I like that your process is also kind of a, like a tactical way that someone else could get into the industry. And I think as we... Uh, I think as an outsider looking at the industry, it seems so impossible to break into. And I guess most industries feel that way as you look into it. And I think hearing you describe like the process of going from I was at shows and I wanted to. And so I figured it out. It's a very like uh, tangible way that someone could get into the universe. And I think that's yeah. like a, a powerful story to hear for other people. It's like got to manifest those dreams a little bit. Absolutely. You know? And do the dirty work to figure it out. Right. Like you were green and I'm, you had to ask questions to ask questions to the right people. You'd be brave enough to go up to them and ask the questions and be in the room for long enough to like earn their respect to get, yeah. I don't know, I think there's a lot of, a lot that goes into that. I mean, it sucks sometimes, you know, it's, it's kind of discouraging when people like, you know, go against your grain, but it, yeah. how are you gonna know unless you just try and you just do it? Yes. So you just, whether it's gonna suck or not, whatever the outcome may be, just fucking do it. Cause you're not gonna know unless you do it, so. Absolutely. Are fun. there other things you're working on now? Like as an adult, we mentioned, yeah, that there's the, the martial arts in the background, there's drums and other instruments. Like, is there anything that you are currently working on learning? I guess in, in the context of vocals, is there a technique we're trying to learn? Like, what are we currently putting that in, energy into now? So as of right now, um, you know, I, I have my careers, stuff like that, but I went to uh, voice acting classes uh, last year. So That's I did really that. cool. Yeah. So right now I'm just finishing off paying the tuition. Um, so I'd like to do like character work. I want to do, you know, like TV shows or something like that. Yeah, rule. Um, okay. So I went through Voice Coaches of America. Which what is, like, is voice acting classes? <laughs> so Tell me everything about it. What's this. funny is, is like I blew through them because me being on a microphone, I already understood most of the dynamics of it. So here we are in classes. So I would uh, Zoom chat with people and then they would just start you like how to pronounce things like with me, I talk very fast and I'm, I'm trying my Same. best right now to slow I'm the down. Worst, yeah. um, so I took a, a, a free class at Baypath in Charlton, and the owner of the company was there. The first thing he does, he just stands up and goes, I'm going to let you know right now, 98% of the people who come into this industry don't make it. So, and then two yeah. people immediately walk, uh, stood up and just <laughs> walked out. But, um, which are the only two sane people in the room <laughs> for the record. <laughs> <laughs> like, but uh, yeah, so he, they just kind of gave us uh, an overlay of what the uh, industry is like. Like there's yeah. a lot of money in it and voice acting is literally anything. You go to a train station. Oh, now boarding this, blah, blah, blah. That is voice acting. People get paid to do that. Hey, you want me to do a two line, three line commercial about, you know, this heart yeah. medication? You can do that. Yep. Oh, you have a training video at Outback Steakhouse. Hey, the, I'm the voice of the guy on the training video. Or, you know, you got your TV shows, you got video games, like anything that requires a voice, there is a profit to be made in it. So um yeah, so basically I took that class and I got a discount for taking the class. So then uh, over the course, I think of a year, just did my Zoom classes. I don't even think I took all of them either. The guy's like, you know what you're doing. So I have my notes and I have like, like it's how like they mark paperwork and like their scripts and stuff like that. Um, but at this point, it's more of me just finishing paying on my tuition. And then uh, they have a website that they have for me that they hook me up with for a year. And then afterwards I can pay like 10 bucks a month to keep it online. Um, and then once everything's paid off and the ball's rolling, then people will start seeking out with this company and say, oh, hey, you know, and the funny thing too is the guy was just like, if you can you do people do accents, can people do voices? And he goes, Fuck that. Forget it. We're not here for that. We're here for the uniqueness of your voice. And I'm like, perfect. So after, Interesting. after I took the free class too, like they asked if we wanted a feedback sheet, because we all did like uh, a couple lines on the mic. And uh, the owner's wife, I think it was, called me back and she goes, I actually think that you got a knack for this. And we don't say that often, but there's one thing you gotta do. Slow down. And I'm just like, I've been hearing it my whole life. I swear I'm trying, but uh yeah, so hopefully with all that being said and done, I'll, I'll, then people start searching for us. Say, hey, I need someone to, with this kind of a voice who talks like this. Then they'll give them like a whole bunch of demos, and then they'll say pick from one, and then they like me. 
hey, guess what? You're going to go do a commercial for something. And what's, what's cool is they actually work with people all over the country with studios. So main goal is tour with the band and then do voice acting stuff. Because say, for example, if we're in Atlanta, Georgia, and I get a call saying, hey, this guy wants you for a commercial. Where are you at? Hey, I'm in Atlanta. Do you have time to go down? I'm off tomorrow. All right, I'll book the studio time for tomorrow. Go do that. I'll go mm-hmm. take an Uber or something while the guys relax on the day off. Come back. There's some. Uh, there's there's more income right there. Yep. So, but like I said, main goal, character work, and like, I guess narrative That's kind of so stuff. Cool. Uh, I will circle back to that. My my tangent here <laughs> that I'll happily take is on is I also have a problem with talking too fast. As I'm sure everyone listening was already aware. Uh, and I it's one of those things. My whole life I've been aware. Of. I used to work at summer camp a lot, so like the kids would always be up my at. That's a terrible phrase. The kids always be <laughs> on my case <laughs> for speaking too fast that they couldn't understand me. And in my brain, it was always like, yo, speed up. Like, this is a you problem. This isn't a me problem. <laughs> and starting the show, I work and I make clips of the show. Uh, and so I have to make subtitles of that. And so I have to, like, thankfully, I used to do it, like, manually. So I used to sit there and type out, like, me, had, like, word by word. Now the car- the computer, like, just, yeah, processes it. And then I have to just go in and uh, adjust words here and there. Usually when anyone else is talking, the computer gets their words perfectly. And I have to change like a band name, a proper noun, put a period here, like no problem. When I talk, this computer has no idea what the fuck is being said. <laughs> it just <laughs> spits out the craziest shit. I'm like, oh no, even AI is too dumb to understand me. Like that's a that's a problem. That's like talk up. to text on my phone too. I'll, yeah. I'll just be like, blah, 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 done. I'm like, and I'll send it and I won't even proofread it. And I'm like, I go back and I'm like, fuck, I look like an idiot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, so that's my fun little tangent there. But uh, the voice acting stuff is fascinating to me, and I, it, it relates to me on like the camera side of stuff. When I watch movies, TV shows, like I have, I describe them as watching a play now, where like I have such a hard time like separating myself and like immersing myself in the thing because I'm so aware of like there's someone holding a camera and these two people who are talking has this conversation a hundred times and there's twelve people telling them how to do it and they do it from all these different angles and there's yeah a boom mic being held over the head that we can't see and the the set behind them isn't actually real it's just like a table and then behind it was a green screen so it's half real half fake and I'm like just all these variables that I'm immersed in as you describe voice acting it feels like it would ruin everything you watch in the same way that camera stuff does because it's everywhere you're right and you would become aware of like I become aware of so many little cuts and so many little details that people will never notice because they're not paying attention to the camera stuff. And as you're having voice acting, you're right that all the like the train conductor in the background, you use that example. It's like you would hear that in the movie and it's like character A and B are talking. The train example in the background is not relevant. It's just to build the atmosphere. And you would hear that voice and go, oh, I don't like that voice. And yeah. totally forget the character A and B are talking. Like, has it affected your ability to consume media or do you feel like you can separate the two? No, I can separate the two. I guess okay. it depends. I mean, if I'm watching like a cringy cartoon or something yeah, like that, yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. I'm like thinking like, who does this person, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what they look like, how they're <laughs> yes, approaching, yes, yes, what yes, their yes. mindset is. But, you know, I, yeah, I mean, if I'm at like, you know, the DMV yeah. and it's like, now serving L, whatever, at Canada yeah. 12, I don't think twice about that. I'm just like, all right, that lady was probably miserable. She picked up a DMV job for voice acting. So, yes. <laughs> You're the, you're, the, you're, the, you're the daunting voice of the DMV that puts people to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I have the same thing. Billboards are the only one that fucked me up so bad as I'm driving. And I see the person. It's like, oh, I can, like, imagine the room you were standing in taking this photo of, like, I don't know. It just it, it makes me so mad. It's like I wish I could just, like, uh, turn that part of my brain off for sometimes. Just consume media for what it is. Or, like, magazines. As I go through each page, it's like, oh, some graphic designer made this page. And on that page, there are photos that some other artist took. And then there's, like, a, a font designer who made this custom font. And it's just all these pieces that get stuck. And, yeah, real hard time separating that and just enjoying something and not using this hypercritical part of my brain. See, on my like, side, I think, like, I understand where you're coming from, even though I don't experience it like you did. Sure. Like, what is it? Uh, when I go up 91 North. I think it is since I was for work I was driving up there yeah there's a billboard for an attorney but it just says ice ice baby and it's just like I think it's the guy uh, uh what's his name whatever Van Winkle uh, Rob Van Winkle but it's yeah. him like slipped on ice and yeah. just like uh, uh, I can't I fall and can't get up or something I'm like this is the cringiest thing I'm like it's 2024 you don't know how to make a billboard interesting it's so bland uh, there's one <laughs> there's it's crazy to rant about billboards on my show but I'm here <laughs> for it and determined to do it there's one billboard to drive past all the time it's like in the fairfield connecticut area and it's for a pool company and it's just a picture of an in-ground pool and there's like one line of text below that says your wife would look so good next to this and it's like what are we doing how is this like yeah how much money are you paying for this billboard to be next to the highway every day just to hope that some guy with a hot wife buys your (laughs) pool like it's so short-sighted and crazy of like 
how many people does not market? Like you're marketing to such a tiny demographic of people where it's like, what are you doing? Who is this like, who is this I for? Think, I think that might be the cuck demographic. But, uh. <laughs> Literally, it's like sell to anyone else. Like why or is this the, why is this the demographic? What are we doing here? And it's been there for years. Like I, I want to believe that it's just like some guy thought it was funny for a month and like, I get it, it's cute, whatever, sex sells, blah, blah, blah. Like you, you can make a marketing argument for it, I guess. Not as a five-year campaign. Yeah, like, it's it's just, not the way to like. The cringe can only I can only handle so much cringe, but for yeah. five years I'm gonna implode. <laughs> <laughs> it's so. nuts. Maybe I'll exaggerate that, but it's been there for a while, and I always drive past it and go like, "Who? Who is funding this? Who is the? Yeah, who didn't think of a better idea for this, and who hasn't driven past it and thought of a better idea?" But neither here nor there. Uh, I think the flip the the tie back in here to band stuff is I'm always worried about then how I'm presenting myself. Like I don't want to have that billboard up and I'm I'm never going to advertise this podcast as like your wife would look so good <laughs> sitting in the podcast, right? That's not my goal here. But there are yeah, tacky ways you can brand yourself and as a band there's certainly tacky ways of the big things coming soon kind of things that bands fall into. Like uh, do you have any trouble then like steering clear of that? Do you feel like you're free to do that or like is the I don't know. I think some people are really good at that tacky thing of like, it is tacky to say big things coming soon, but it's also important to promote yourself and to stay on top of that. But for me personally, it feels so disingenuous. That I have no ability to. Yeah. Where are you in this, in this spectrum? Um, I'm kind of on par with you. Yeah. Uh, there was one time though, when I was making a post for our page and I did say big things coming <laughs> and Maddie immediately messaged me and goes, no, you're going to go back and you're going to fix that. So, and I mean, I was fresh with bands. I didn't really know that whole lore and stuff yeah. like that. So I was just like, okay. And then I'm like, oh, wait, now, oh, now I get it. Cause, <laughs> cause everyone always busted like each other's balls about it. They're like, yeah, oh, yeah big things coming. But it, it is the, the, the but truth of band. It life. is the truth. It, we do have big things coming and you can't talk about them. And no one wants to talk about them once they're happening. It is only right mm -hmm. now as you are working on them, they're fun to talk about. And by release day, it's not fun to talk about it anymore. By release day, it's like, <gasps> okay. Yeah, maybe Fine. maybe it's like a super super. Um, why am I? Well, it's like superstition, superstition kind of thing. It's like it's yeah, a yeah. jinx. Like, hey, we we said it. Now <laughs> we're screwed. True. Go find the nearest piece of wood and knock on it uh, immediately, kind of thing. So probably an element of that. Yeah, I'm pissed off that hotels don't have thirteenth the thirteenth floor in them. That's another random. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard, wait, what is that? I've heard that fact before, the 13th floor thing. It's just because 13 was an unlucky number, so they just, like, hotels somehow were like, oh, we're just not going to do that. And so now hotels just don't have a 13th floor. <laughs> and this annoys me because I was at an event yesterday that was on the 14th floor, and to get to the 14th floor, you have to go to the 12th floor and take one staircase up to the 14th floor. Okay. Do uh, they have any more floors above the 14th? No. Oh, that's so So it was 12, stupid. one staircase, and 14. And I was like, yo, this... <laughs> This is the 13th floor. Like, I don't need all this going on here. Um, but yes, that is my my very urgent gripes here. Um, I like to wrap up here uh, as we get towards our hour mark. Uh, with other, like, high water marks, is there anything else you look back at your time with Shape Throw that stands out as, like, a, a moment that you're proud of? So I think we talk about, like, the big shows, and those are the, the sexy moments. Uh, but I think of oftentimes, like, there are times at the merch booth where someone comes up and says something to you that sticks with you. And I'm not asking for that person's identity or whatever, but, like, are there moments like that? Is there a tattoo someone got of shape that stands out with you? Is there a time that, yeah, what stands out as you is, like, these kind of little subtle shape that are high water marks? Well, I mean, on a side note, I don't think anyone's got a shape or tattoo besides all of us in the band. Uh, so we, on that first weekender that we did, we all got a tattoo from one of uh, Maddie's friends in somewhere in Maine. So Sick. we all got a shape thrower one way or another. Okay. Um, but where are they? Are so they like ass tattoos? Are they no, like no. So mine's on my thigh, and <laughs> okay. essentially, so James did it in the ACDC font, and then Maddie and Zach got it in the Slayer font. Mike unfortunately didn't have enough time to do it because we had to go to our next destination. But I got mine with the middle school S as the shape thrower, and then it's just like really haggard handbook <laughs> writing, like graffiti. But it, it looks good. Okay. And then the T's an upside down cross, and <laughs> oh, it, yeah. it just goes right above my thigh right here. So. Fine. Um, okay. But in terms of like, you know, at the merch booth experiences, you know, Gideon definitely was a good one for us because it was a lot of people that just go to big shows. They don't really know local life. Yep. So, I mean, we were getting like parents with kids that were there and they were coming up saying like, wow, we've never heard of you guys before. You guys are stellar. Um, it's a very interesting experience. Like you guys have your own unique sound and you're like, I mean, yeah, we branch all over metalcore a little bit, like, you know, a little bit of, I consider ourselves more melodic hardcore, although the guys won't say so, but you know, <laughs> metalcore in general, like we branch all over the place. So we keep things interesting for people. So we get different people that we wouldn't expect. You can be like a very you know, small kind of timid person, or you can be that big brolic motherfucker who goes to hate breed pits uh, and paper shows and throws down the pits. But there's always yeah. a little something for somebody yep. that they like. And, um, but no, like, you know, there's people coming up and like 
saying, you know, this, this type of music stuff that we look for and stuff like that. And it's just really cool. And it's fulfilling to see people actually enjoy our music and what we do on stage and the energy that we bring. And that's another reason why I go all out is because, you know, you can get these kids that, you know, might be shy. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, they had the, the courage to go out with their parents and go and see the show or with their friends for once. And i maybe the other bands don't perform like we do, but at least we'll be memorable. And he just goes, Hey, I like that band. It, you know, it made me feel good inside watching them. They have dope music, and I just watched, you know, the singer do this wicked spin kick off the stage or something like that. That's cool shit. And that's gonna make... just knocked my dad out. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that that just will help encourage them to want to like, you know, kind of get out of their funks and yeah, just brings brings a little bit more happiness and light to them. So absolutely, is that uh, one of the big motivators for you? Where I like, think as I look at my own art, I think I'm always wondering like why I do this. Where it doesn't make sense to me. I think there's a much more logical approach to take a nine to five day job and like not do this. Like I think what we do is a uh, if we were to put it on paper, it's a bad choice. And I think our soul's desire to do it and our soul's necessity to do it, it makes it a worthwhile approach. But like. Uh, on paper, it's not <laughs> the best way to spend our time. No. So I'm always looking at it like, yeah, what is it for me? And I think for me, it's like I do it for like the 12-year-old version of me. Who is that kid at the crowd who would have been there, who would have needed to see someone on stage and be like, oh, I can do something different. There is something different in this world for me that didn't quite feel like it was opening its door to me. Uh, is there something that motivates you? Is someone like, is there a voice in your head that you look back on as like that keeps you going when things get busy? Um. I mean, a lot of it is, is to help me express who I am to while mm -hmm. the, the demons I fight in my head. But I mean, it's just the general like people because I mean, I want to write music for people who, you know, just want to feel that type of way. Yeah. Um, I don't really have much more of an explanation for it, but it's just, I guess, yeah, the, the luxury of making people feel something other than their every everyday thing, you know? Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's all we need. It's yeah. escape. Yeah. Escapism, I think, is the, the key. The key there. Mm -hmm. um, hell yes, dude. Last question for you. We chatted a lot about the music stuff. I'm always curious about life outside of music. So we've <laughs> talked about this, yeah, one track. I think, yeah, you mentioned there's car stuff happening, the way I get the music managing stuff. So what else is happening in life outside of uh, outside of performing music? What else are you interested in? What else are you learning? What else are you working on? Um, realistically, nothing. Um, okay. I mean, I, I got some, like, activities. I go play disc golf, love playing disc golf. Oh, yes. um, How did you get into that? Um, so basically, I grew up in Oxford. Uh, we have Buffenville. There's a disc golf course there. And, you know, it's, I would drive by. I'd be down there fishing. I'd just be seeing people chucking plastic around. And you're like, <laughs> what the fuck are these guys doing? And then in high school, one of our teachers ended up starting a club. And he was... He, I guess you can consider him like semi-pro. He was also a triple-A baseball player, so the guy had an arm. So um, he taught me the fundamentals of it, how to actually properly throw, taught me that there's an actual science behind it. And uh, I just I started picking up – I got a basic beginner kit that they offered through the program at the school. So you give them like 50 bucks, you get like three discs or something like that, or like four discs, and then you just start trekking, and you go in groups, and you just start learning the fundamentals of it. But it's just nice. You, an hour and a half to two hours out of your day, you just go walk around, you breathe in life, you know, and you play a fun strategic game. And uh, it's on that, it just always clicked for me. And then obviously, you know, once you get into it, hey, you know, there's different types of discs, there's of cool course. courses, you know, there's different like events and stuff going on. Yeah. It's become such a big thing. And where I'm from, uh, Maple Hill, um, I think it still is, is rated the number one disc golf course in the world. I could be wrong. I might have just got outvoted by somewhere in California, but it has always been. So we have the Vibram Open, which is like a world like tournament that happens at um, it's I think it's Leicester or Worcester. It's like right on the line this on is Marshall Street. Really news to me. That's oh yeah, I dude. Like people from all over the world. We had this guy Simon Lee Zott move from Germany to Worcester <laughs> for this course because it's his normal practice course and stuff like that. But like, that's so weird. Yeah, there's pro players that live around our area now too because the sport has just been popping off like crazy. I think it started in like the 70s, like mid to late 70s, but it has just been slowly and steadily gaining traction and I think upwards of like you know 10 15 years ago was when it really started to pop off in this area and now you see everybody out on a course or something like that yes. but I got some advice when I was starting here when I was shooting shows <laughs> that I didn't like and I would shoot a band that I didn't love and it's like who wants to see a picture of this band this band stinks internally it was my dialogue mm. and it's like oh there are people who love them and the advice I got was something to the effect of like don't underestimate the size of an audience that you're not a part of and disc golf is now the perfect example for this for me of like, I never would have guessed that two hours up the road is like the the international hub of disc golf in the world. That is an absurd thing to have. Not absurd. It's just an unbelievable to me. I never would it's have obscure, guessed. It's obscure, pretty much. I would have <laughs> said it was in Texas, California. Like it seems Seattle maybe seems like a good place for it. But yeah. like Worcester was never the number one place to put the hub of that. Definitely. Um, my only thought there is that you're like a really like. A uh, determined learner. Whereas you describe, like, you taught yourself the management stuff, you taught yourself drums, we got into disc golf. Like, it seems like you're always picking up new hobbies. Like, 
it seems like you're really good at learning stuff and like committing yourself to stuff. And yeah, that, that mental determination of like, most people don't get past whatever week one, week two of the thing. And it seems like you're really good at being like, no, I'm going to suck at this for a little bit, but I'll suck a little bit less if I stick with yeah, it. Yeah, that goes back to that. At least keep doing it. I'm like, you're not going to know until you try it. So yeah, I mean, I'll keep my interest in it. But yeah, if I start sucking at it, I'm going to be like, all right, maybe <laughs> it's time to find something new. But at least I gave it, you know, the old college try yeah. in order to see if I'm going to stick with it or not. Yeah. So, but also too, that goes to my ADHD and hyper fixating on certain things. So, but it all, it all plays its role in one way or another. So is there a next, next one you have in mind? <coughs> is there a next, yeah. Basket weaving. Is there another goal that we're looking at? I up here. I don't know. Basket weaving sounds pretty fucking fun. <laughs> <though>. <laughs> um, not nothing really. Um, I do. Oh, I also ride motorcycles too. I love okay. motorcycles. Um, what do we ride? Like, like Harley, like sport speed bike. What I, we... I like cruisers and I like sport bikes, but okay. I have an 05 Suzuki S uh, V six fifty S, which is the type of sport bike It's yep. technically a sport touring, which is more of a relaxed yeah, yeah, version yeah. of a, of a yep. sport bike. Um, right now that's kind of down. So I'm, I'm in the process of fixing that, but, um, I want as many motorcycles as possible. It's just, that's... you know, money and stuff like that. But yeah. one day I'll, I'll get myself a nice cruiser. I'll get myself a nicer sport bike, but I started riding probably like four years ago okay and uh, i put a lot of miles on that bike so that's my baby i gotta fix her up i'm gonna repaint her stuff like that and then um once that's fixed and ready to go save up a little bit more money get a nicer bike you know bigger engine sure and then from there once i have like two sport bikes i'll end up getting myself a nice cruiser okay so. <laughs> is the goal vintage or like new um I think I could say I really like a lot of the new stuff. I mean, I do like Harleys, but I'm also a Honda guy too. I think Honda engines are, you know, pretty bulletproof. Um, so I'd probably go back to like early to mid 2000s, I guess. But I mean, just like everything else, stuff holds their value. Um, you can look at a Harley from 15, 20 years ago. The thing's probably still in five digits. So I, I like cheap, dirty. <laughs> if I break it or if, it, if something happens to it, I go, oh, you know, I just spent $2,500 on this bike. Yep. Not the end of the world. You yes. know, I'll, I'll save up yeah. and grab another three, four thousand dollars. Sell for parts, so. get some of that money back and life will go. Yeah. Hard. Yeah. yeah. So hell yes, dude. Mission accomplished. We did it. I appreciate you coming through today. Yeah. Episode 61 with Dominic Morelli. 62. I apologize with Dominic Morelli. Uh, Even numbers wanna, only. <laughs> <laughs> anything you want to plug before we get out of here? Uh, so where can people find Shape Thrower online? Where can they find you online? Uh, where can people follow you and tell you that you did awesome today? Um, so you can find Shape Thrower on all social media platforms. Um, we have a YouTube, but it's not really up and running yet. We have a couple like videos going, but you know, until music videos start popping off, mm -hmm. we're not really going to run that page. Yep. But you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I don't think we have a TikTok yet. Um, we're on uh, Apple Music, iTunes, uh, not iTunes, uh, Spotify, pretty much everything that everyone uses, you can find us on. Um, online, um, you can find me, Instagram, I'm Crocodile Dom D. Uh, people seem to like that handle a little bit. Um, and then. <laughs> Is there uh, a story behind that? Honestly, I have like aliases, like my friends, especially in the band Kerrigan, like they have so many different like aliases <laughs> for me. Like okay. I'm Crocodile Dom D, I'm Pasta Dom, I'm Dominici Pepperoni. Um, <laughs> dude, it's just at the list goes on. I can't okay. think of them all right now, but I'd say probably upwards of 20 to 25 different like Jesus. nicknames or aliases okay. just throughout the years. I have, like I said, I'm very eccentric. Um, <laughs> I, I like to be a colorful person and yeah, it's just, it just brings itself, it brings itself upon yeah. me. So <laughs> hell yes, dude, mission accomplished. We'll get to the bottom of those names next episode. Yeah. Um, for the moment, I appreciate you making coming down, making the trip down here. We did it. Episode 62 in the books. Hell yeah. Hell yes, dude.